Hi there, this is Richard Walker from Lucidate and welcome to this guide on the 10 essential machine learning algorithms in 17 minutes. In 17 minutes, we can only scratch the surface. So if you want more details than you get here, then there are links to deep dive playlists in the description, as well as on-screen links at the end of this video. Machine learning is transforming our world, but how do these algorithms actually work their magic? In this video, we'll break down the 10 most important machine learning algorithms in simple terms that anyone can understand. For each algorithm, I'll explain the key concepts, give you an intuition for how they work, and provide a useful analogy. By the end, you'll have a solid grasp of the most important machine learning techniques. Stick around until the end for links to a deep dive into each of these algorithms. So let's dive in and unlock the secrets of machine learning. Support vector machines or SVMs find the optimal boundary line or hyperplane to separate data into different classes. A hyperplane is a high dimensional equivalent of a line. SVMs maximize the margin, the distance between the hyperplane and the closest data points on each side. These data points are called support vectors. SVMs essentially find the widest street that separates clumps of data. Some outliers called slack variables can lie within the margin either side of the separating hyperplane. The SVM algorithm seeks to maximize the width of the margin while minimizing the amount of slack variables. Often by projecting the data into higher dimensions, you can find a more effective and simple hyperplane to separate the data. Here, no single line exists in two dimensions to separate the data, but in three dimensions, it's easy to draw a plane between the closest support vectors. You'll hear this called the kernel trick. Picture an SVM as a sports coach selecting players for two positions, attackers and defenders. The coach evaluates various attributes of each player, height, speed, strength and agility to determine their suitability for each position. The coach then finds the clearest possible separation between the two positions. The players closest to this line are the most versatile ones, which the coach uses as reference points to maintain the separation. New players are then easily assigned a position based on which side of the line they fall on. Linear regression models the relationship between a target variable, like a house price, and one or more input variables, like square footage, by fitting a straight line to the data points. The goal is to find the line that minimizes the distance between the points and the line using an approach called ordinary least squares. The linear regression line captures the overall trend in the data. As the inputs increase, does the output tend to go up or down? The slope of the line shows how much the output changes for each one unit increase in the input. Here we see the red line seeking to fit the house price from the square footage. Typically, the larger the house, the more it costs. Linear regression scales well to include other data points too, such as proximity to transport hubs, number of bedrooms, etc. While multiple dimensions are hard to visualize, they present no problem at all to the algorithm. Logistic regression. Despite its name, logistic regression is used for binary classification, not regression. It predicts the probability that an input belongs to the default class. This probability is calculated by passing the weighted sum of the inputs through the sigmoid function, which squashes the output to be between 0 and 1. If the probability is above a threshold like 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, the input is then classified as being in the default class. Logistic regression finds a decision boundary where the probability shifts from less than 50% to greater than 50% to separate two classes. Unlike support vector machines, which defines the boundary based on a few support vectors, logistic regression uses information from all the data points to find the best hyperplane. The weights tell you the relative importance of each input in pushing the probability of the default class towards one. Logistic regression is like a loan approval system. It considers various input features of the loan application, debt to income, 
overdraft ratio, repayment frequency, etc., and weights them by importance. As with linear regression, the algorithm easily copes with multiple parameters. K nearest neighbors, or KNN, is a non-parametric algorithm that classifies a data point based upon the majority class of its K nearest neighbors. To predict the class of a new point, KNN finds the K points in the training data that are closest to it in the feature space and returns the most common class amongst these neighbors. In this example, choosing where X1 and X2 are classified is easy. However, X3 is more nuanced. The number of neighbors K is a key hyperparameter that needs to be tuned and as you can see, will affect which classification marginal points will be assigned to. KNN makes the reasonable assumption that similar data points tend to have the same class. So to classify a new point, it looks at the labels of the most similar points in the training set the optimal K then balances fitting the local structure of the data, small k, and avoiding noise from individual points, large k. Imagine you move to a new city and want to know what the best restaurants are. You could survey your K closest friends and choose the eatery that the majority of them support. If K equals 3, you might be swayed by one very close friend with quirky tastes. But if K equals 20, you'll get a more representative sample of the local preferences. Decision trees. Decision trees learn a series of hierarchical decision rules to partition the data into pure subsets. At each node, the tree splits on the feature that best separates the classes based on a metric like Gini impurity or information gain. This process is repeated recursively until the leaf nodes contain only data points from the same class. Decision trees essentially ask a series of yes-no questions to zoom in on the correct class. The features that are most informative for distinguishing the classes are placed closer to the root of the tree. As you move down the tree, the questions become more specific to smaller subsets of the data. The final leaf nodes represent the purest possible class assignments based on the available features. A decision tree is like playing a game of 20 questions to guess what animal someone is thinking of. You want to ask the most informative questions first to narrow down the possibilities quickly. For example, is it a mammal is a good initial question, while does it have spots would only be helpful after you've ruled out reptiles, birds, etc. Each question is like a node in the decision tree. The decision tree uses the training data to come up with the optimal set of questions to classify the samples. Random forests. Random forests are an ensemble method that combines many decision trees to improve accuracy and reduce overfitting. It trains a large number of trees on random subsets of the data and features and averages their predictions. By introducing randomness, the trees are decorrelated, which means their errors are more likely to cancel out when the trees are combined. Random forests leverage the wisdom of the crowd. The idea that the collective opinion of a diverse group is often more accurate than any single expert. Each tree can be thought of as a narrow subject matter expert that makes predictions based on a very limited view of the data. By combining the predictions of many narrow experts trained on different subsets, random forests arrive at a more robust and accurate consensus. A random forest is like a panel of medical specialists from different fields examining a patient. Each doctor has unique insights based on their area of expertise and experience with past cases. To reach a final diagnosis, they discuss their opinions and come to a collective consensual decision. Even if a few doctors make mistakes, the overall panel decision is likely to be accurate. Gradient boosting, e.g. add a boost. Gradient boosting is another ensemble method that iteratively combines weak learners, often decision trees, into a strong learner, 
But unlike random forests, which contain trees independently, gradient boosting trains them sequentially. Each new tree is fit to the residuals of the previous trees to minimize the overall error. In Adaboost, misclassified examples are given higher weights in subsequent iterations. Gradient boosting works by progressively improving on the mistakes of previous models. It starts with a simple model, like a decision tree, and then adds new models that focus on the data points that were hard to classify correctly. By iteratively targeting the weak points, gradient boosting can fit complex patterns in the data. Here, this decision tree, misclassified, i.e. got 17.7% .7 of the test data, wrong. This is shown in yellow. So for the next classifier in our sequence of classifiers, let's artificially skew the training data and boost the amount of examples that our first classifier got wrong. For our next classifier in our sequence, we'll then artificially boost the training data set with examples where both models disagree, here shown in red. In this way, we get successive classifiers to overcome the weaknesses in prior models, with the result that the ensemble is more robust than any individual model. Imagine a student preparing for an exam by taking practice tests. After each test, they focus their study on the topics that they got wrong, gradually improving their weak areas. In the next practice test, they'll do better on those questions but may still make some mistakes. By repeatedly targeting their weaknesses, they can boost their overall test score. Naive Bayes. Naive Bayes is a probabilistic model that predicts an output class given a set of input features. It finds the class that is most probable given the observed features. The naive assumption is that all the input features are independent from each other. This is rarely true in practice, but hugely simplifies the calculations. Naive Bayes combines evidence from different features to make a classification. For each class, such as whether a loan applicant will default or not, it uses existing test data to calculate the probabilities of observing each feature value if that class were true and multiplies them together. This gives a score for how well the evidence fits each possible class then it simply picks the class with the highest probability score. Naive Bayes is like a jury deciding a court case based on multiple witness testimonies. Each witness provides their opinion independently, and the jury reaches a verdict by considering the combined weight of all the testimonies, assuming that the witnesses didn't coordinate their stories. Principal Component Analysis, or PCA, is a dimensionality reduction technique that transforms high dimensional data into a lower dimensional space while preserving the most important information. It identifies the principal components, which are the directions of maximum variance in the data, and projects the data onto these components to obtain a compact representation. PCA can be thought of as a data summarization tool that provides a concise view of high dimensional data. Similar to how an executive summary condenses a lengthy report into a few key points, PCA reduces the original data into a smaller set of principal components that capture the essence of the information, making it easier to grasp the main ideas. Picture PCA as a travel agent planning a trip to a new city. The city has countless attractions, but the travel agent knows that most visitors are interested in a few key aspects, such as history, culture or food. By focusing on these principal components and creating an itinerary that highlights the most important sites, the travel agent can provide a comprehensive yet manageable experience of the city. T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding, or TSNI. TSNI is a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique that maps high dimensional data into a lower dimensional space, much like PCA. Typically, it will map down to 2D or 3D while preserving the local structure of the data. It aims to place similar data points close together and dissimilar points far apart in the lower dimensional representation. 
Imagine Tisney as a party planner arranging guests at a dinner table. The planner knows that certain guests have similar interests or backgrounds and would enjoy each other's company. By seating these guests close together and keeping dissimilar guests apart, the planner creates a seating arrangement that encourages engaging conversations and minimizes awkward interactions. In summary, we've explored 10 essential machine learning algorithms that form the foundation of modern AI and data science. From linear regression and support vector machines to random forests and gradient boosting, each algorithm has its unique strengths and applications. We learned how linear regression fits a line to data points to capture trends, while support vector machines find the widest street separating classes. Naive Bayes combines feature probabilities to make classifications, and logistic regression predicts class probabilities using the sigmoid function. K nearest neighbors classifies points based on their closest peers, and decision trees ask a series of questions to partition data. Random forests and gradient boosting are powerful ensemble methods that combine multiple trees to improve accuracy and reduce overfitting. PCA and TSNI are dimensionality reduction techniques that help summarize and visualize high dimensional data in a compact, intuitive way. By understanding these algorithms and their intuitions, you'll be well equipped to tackle a wide range of machine learning problems and make data driven decisions in your work. Whether you're predicting customer churn, diagnosing diseases or building recommender systems, these algorithms are the tools you need to unlock the power of your data. So go forth and apply these techniques to your own projects. And don't forget to check out the links in the description for deeper dives into each algorithm. With practice and perseverance, you'll soon be a machine learning master, ready to take on the challenges of the data-driven world. In the next video, we'll be looking at real-world applications of these techniques so that you will have the grounding and confidence to use the right algorithm for the right use case. Hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to ensure you never miss another video from Lucidate.